our topics for today are multiplexers and numbers. So, what is a multiplexer? So, a multiplexer, for short, would just be called a MUX. We could say is a, a binary router or a type of binary router. Let's draw the circuit symbol for it here. So let's consider the case where we have four inputs. They come into this device and then we have one output. Well, the output Y and the inputs we'll call A, B, C, and D. Okay, and these are all logic variables. So this is a MUX here. So the, what this thing is going to do is it's going to direct one of these inputs to the output. So we could have Y is equal to A. Well, we could direct A to, to the output Y, or we could have Y is equal to B. Or we could have Y is equal to C, or we could have Y is equal to D. Now, what determines which one of these cases occurs? Well, we need have two other input signals here. We call these selection signals, S1 and S0. So maybe we determine that if S1 and S0 uh, are 0 and 0, then we connect A to the output. If they are 0 and 1, we connect B. If they are 1 and 0, we connect C. And if they're 1, 1, then we connect D. That would be an example. So in this case, we really have four inputs, two additional inputs that are selection signals and one output. This would be called a 4 to 1 multiplexer or MUX. Now, how many selection signals do you need? Well, right, if I have two, then I get two to the two is four different possible combinations of ones and zeros, and that could account for four different inputs, right? So generally, if I have M selection signals, I can have two to the M inputs. You know, you could actually implement something like this mechanically with a switch. So here could be your A, B, C, and D inputs. And here would be your Y output. And then these are just connected by a switch that has, um, is able to be put into these four different positions. This would be a single pole, right? There's this, this one pole here that can be moved to, in this case, four different positions. So it would be a four throw, single pole, four throw switch. And the instructions about where to put this switch would be contained in the S1, S0 data bits. What would you do with these kinds of devices? Why do we need them? Well, for example, the multiplexer here, uh, this might be connected, the output might be, say, an, an input port of a microcontroller. And the A, B, C, and D might be four different peripheral devices, maybe different sensors or something like that. And we don't have enough input ports on the microcontroller to connect all of our sensors or all of our peripherals. So we use a multiplexer like this. And then the uh, microcontroller can set these selection signals to connect to any one of these peripherals and then read its data and then change the selection signals and then connect to another peripheral, et cetera. Okay, so that's, that's one important use is something like this. Now we can take the mirror image of a multiplexer, go the other way and make this the input and these the outputs. And then we get something called a deep multiplexer. And it would look maybe something like this.
And now we'll use A for our, our input and W, X, Y, and Z for our outputs. This would be a demultiplexer or demux. It would also need selection signals, S1 and S0 here. And now this is going to have the, the states that W is equal to A or W uh, or X is equal to A, sorry. Or Y is equal to A or Z is equal to A. And these four different states could be determined by the value S1 and S0, say it's 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Now, other names for multiplexer and demultiplexer are the, the multiplexer sometimes is called a data selector by changing these selection signals. We can choose different data streams. And the demultiplexer is sometimes called a data distributor. We've got one data stream, the input A, and we select which output we distribute that data to. Now, an application for the DMUX could be, again, this could be an output port, say, of a microcontroller, and these would be a number of different peripheral devices which we want to control. And we could use the selection signals to connect the output port of the microcontroller to a given one of these peripherals and then send control signals to that. Then change the selection signals to connect to a different peripheral and send control signals to that and so on. So they essentially if you had limited numbers of input and output ports, one application of multiplexers or demultiplexers, depending on whether in this case you want to have input and in this case you want to have output, would be just to multiply the number of connections to the external world. An interesting application of both a multiplexer and demultiplexer uh, would look something like this. Let's suppose we have four signals here, A, B, C, and D. And we can have these different select signals, and we're going to call these T1 and T0 instead of S1 and S0. And those will then go to some output. And that output, we can then take maybe a long, long way away and make that the input of a demultiplexer now. Here's a mux, and here's a demux. Okay, and this is going to have four outputs. W, X, Y, and Z. And it's going to have two selector signals we'll call R1 and R0. So we can think of the multiplexer as being on the transmitting side. Right? The data is going to flow from left to right in this case. Um, and so the, the T1 and T0 signals would just determine which of these channels, A, B, C, and D, would be transmitted over this connection we'll call the trunk. And then the demultiplexer is like the receiver, and it determines from these control signals R1 and R0 which one of these outputs, W, X, Y, or Z, is going to get that information that goes over the trunk. Right. So by this appropriate selection of the T's and the R's, we could set up a communication signal, say that it went from A over the trunk, to Y at the output. All right, so you, things like this, of course, are very common in like telephone systems. So especially uh, in traditional systems where you would have, say, a, a neighborhood where you'd have a, a local uh, switching system. People can talk to each other, but if you want to make a long distance call, there are many fewer lines available for long distance calls. And so you would use like a multiplexer idea like this to allow uh, a subset of your base here 
to make a long distance call. And then this would be on the receiving end. They would be then routed to the appropriate output. And in the early days of phone systems, all of this, these connections were, were done literally by, with switches like this. And they were actually made with patch wires. You know, operators would physically ask you where you wanted to call and then make these patch connections. Of course, these days it's all done by computer control. But it's the same idea. What if you wanted A, B, C, and D all to be able to make different calls or different data connections to different outputs? Like, so maybe this is A wants to connect to Y, and maybe B wants to connect to W, and maybe C wants to connect to Z, and D maybe wants to connect to X, uh, but we only have one wire here for our trunk. This is very common, like if, the, if this trunk wire is very, very long, maybe it's a transatlantic cable or something. It's very expensive to have a whole bunch of communication wires going under the ocean. And we, but we have you know, many, many users that want to talk, say in North America, that want to talk to people in Great Britain or something. Uh, how can we do this? Well, very convenient aspect of this when used with a digital system is we could have some kind of a situation that would look like following. Say this is in time. And let's say this is our A signal. So there's some ones and zeros in here throughout time. And then maybe this is our, our B user's data stream. And then maybe here is our C. And finally, we've got our D. Okay, so we have four different channels of data that want to go to four different, from to four different uh, transmitters that want to go to four different receivers. We only have one wire, or maybe it's a wireless uh, channel or something like that. But what we can do is if this is a, a very high bandwidth communication channel, so like a fiber optic cable, then what we can do is in the same period of time, uh, here, in the same period of time, what we can do is we can take the A data stream. So let's say the, these this A, B, C, and D data streams come in parallel, and we record them in, in memory. We'll talk about random access memory later. We record them, and then we send them out at a much higher data rate. So the bits go out much, much faster. So that means it takes, let's say they go out four times faster. So it takes one-fourth the time to transmit the A data stream over this trunk. So here's A. And then likewise, B and C and D. Now notice what happened. You have the same amount of time, delta T here, and you transmit all the data. But in, th in this case, it's four data streams at a relatively low data rate. Here, you've got four data streams in different time windows at a much higher data rate. So you can transmit all of these parallel channels over one channel at a much higher bandwidth. And then at the other end, you can take these out, reduce the, the data rate back down to the normal data rate, and then use the demultiplexer then to assign those to WX, YZ, and so on. Okay, so at the other end, you know, A here would go to, say, to, to Y, and the B here to W, etc. And in fact, that kind of structure is used extensively in, in the Internet, in the phone system, and so on. Um, you've got very high bandwidth, usually fiber optic cable that forms the backbone, that carries data uh, at very high data rates, so that allows you to, to compress in time a low data rate signal to a, a short, a long low data rate signal to a short high data rate signal. And then you can paste a bunch of those high data rate signals together in different time blocks. 
So you can only have to need one fiber optic cable, say, to carry all these different signals. And then on the other end, you can break those up again and then distribute them out to the receivers. So now let's see how we would actually use um, logic gates to build a multiplexer. Let's start off with the simplest multiplexer, a two to one multiplexer. Okay, so here's the circuit symbol. We've got two inputs, A and B. And we've got a single output, Y. Now, how many selection signals do we need here? Well, we've only got two possibilities. Y is equal to A, or Y is equal to B. So, two possibilities, that can be handled with a single selection signal. S is equal to zero, for example, might give you Y is equal to A, and S is equal to one, might give you Y is equal to B. Okay, so we could have then a truth table that would look like this. It's a little, little different than we're, we're used to. Uh, we'd say here's S and here's Y. When S is zero, Y is A. When S is one, Y is B. And this is a little more abstract. Uh, for a given value of S, the value of Y is not a one or a zero, but whatever the one or zero value of A is, Whereas if S is one, it's whatever the one or zero value of B is. Okay, so how would we represent this? Well, we could say Y equals not S and A, right? Now, why would that be true? Because if S is zero, then not S is one, and one and A is equal to A. Okay, but, but what about the B signal? Well, we could put that in by putting or S and B. Now, if S is equal to 1, then this is 1 and B, which is equal to B. But the first term is not 1, which is 0, 0 and A, which is 0, right? So here we'd have S is equal to 0, then this would be 1 and A or 0 and B, which is, of course, equal to A. And if S is equal to 1, then not 1 would be 0, 0 and A, or S and B, 1 and B, which of course is equal to B. Well, let's see, what's the logic gate impl implementation then? Well, we could do this. Um, here we're going to have two ands uh, and then an or. Okay, so let's put our two and gates here. There. And there, sort of. And those are going to be ORed together. So we'll put an OR gate down here. That'll be our output Y. And the input to the first one must be not S and A. Okay. So the not, we're going to, that's going to be a burger here. And then this is going to be A. There will be A. And this is going to be S. So that's going to be not S and A. Or S and B. Okay. So we need to take this S signal off. Take it down here and put it in as one of the inputs there. And then also have B. So this, right, this output right here is not S and A, and this output of this AND gate is S and B. And of course, then you OR those together to get your output Y. Okay, so that's a two to one MUX. Just takes a few gates. What if we want to have, say, a four to one, like we were looking at earlier? Okay, let's look at the four to one case. And now we know, right, that's the picture we had previously, like up here. We, we're gonna need two selector signals because we got four inputs. We get, so two to the two is four. 
And so now our truth table is going to look something like this. Here's S1, here's S0, and now let's look at the min term for that and the value we want for y. Okay, so let's say when they're both zero, we want y to be equal to a. When we have zero, well, let me move it down a little bit. Zero, one, uh, we want y to be equal to b. When we have one, zero, we want y is equal to c. And when we have one, one, we want y is equal to d. What would be the min terms in terms of S1 and S0? What is something that would be 1 for that row and 0 for all of the rows? Well, this would be not S1 and not S0. Because this would be 1 and 1 for this row. For any other row, one of these S1 or S0 is going to be 1, and the not of that will be 0, and 0 and anything else is 0. Okay. Next, next row, we've got not S1 and S0. Here we've got S1 and not S0. And finally, we've got S1 and S0. So what can, well, how can we use those to get A, B, C, or D? Well, let's take A, and let's and it with the min term. So S1, not S1, and not S0, and A. Of course, for this row, not S1 and not S0 is going to be 1, so this is just 1 and A. But for all other rows, it would be 0. For the next row, we'd have, oops, not S1 and S0, and B would be 1 and B, of course, which is, which is equal to B, but only for that row, and it's 0 for all other rows. For C, we take the min term S1 and not S0 and C, and that's 1 and C for that row. And then for D, we've got S1 and S0 and D is 1 and D for that row and 0 for all of the rows. And so we see that uh, our implementation then would be that Y is just the OR of all these min terms and with the different data streams, A, B, C, and D. So we'd have not S1 and not S0 and A, or not S1 and S0 and B, or S1 and not S0 and C, or S1 and S0 and D. And that would be our logic function. Okay, so the standard way to to implement that is kind of the straightforward way would be to use three input AND gates here and then just have say our S or S1 and our S0 signals here and then get the inverted versions of those. Right, and then we can pull off either S1 or not S1 and S0 and not S0, to, okay, and put those into our, our AND gate. So let's say uh, for the, the, the one zero row, we're going to have S1. So we come over here, grab this guy, and not S0. So this would be not S0. And then the other input would be C, okay? And that would be that term right there. And just do that for those four terms. And then just have a four input OR gate over here. And then your output would be your logic function Y. Now, what if we wanted to have an eight to one multiplexer? Well, yeah, let's sketch this out first. Um, it gets inconvenient to have the inputs be A, B, C, D, etc. Now we're going to start using subscripts. So we're going to have I0, I1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7.
Okay. And then this is gonna, oops. Give us a single output here of Y. And how many selection signals will we need? Well, we've got eight inputs. Two to the three is equal to eight, so we're gonna need three inputs. We'll call those S2, S1, and S0. This is our MUX there. <clears throat> and our truth table would look like S2, S1, S0, Y, all the possibilities for the selection signal 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and then 1, let me move them down here, put a little space, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. And what would be the outputs? Well, with this, we want y to be i0, i1, i2, and i3. Then i4, i5, i6, and i7. And we could do just as we did for the 4 to 1 multiplexer. We could write the min terms for each one of these rows and in terms of the three variables, like the first one would be not S2 and not S1 and not S0, and then and that with I0, and then or do the same thing for the next row, etc. Okay. However, in looking at this structure here, we look at the, these two blocks, the first four rows and the last four rows. We can notice something. Look at the S1 and S0 sequence of ones and zeros, they're identical. And in the first block, S2 is always equal to zero. In the second block, S2 is always equal to one. So if you look at this first block, if you, and if you ignore S2, it looks like this is like a four to one multiplexer. And the second block with, if you ignore S2, is again, another four to one. This seems to be telling us that instead of just going in from scratch, designing an, an eight to one multiplexer, we could use our existing, you know, four to one that we had previously and s kind of paste two of those together with a little bit of other logic having to do with the S2 value. In fact, that logic that we would use to paste these two together could itself just be a two to one multiplexer. So let's see how we would do that. Here's what we could do. Oops. Okay, so here's I zero, let me space them out a little bit. I zero, I one. I2 and I3, got an output there. And this is going to have now S1 and S0. Okay, so this is going to be, forget S2 here. This is going to just be this block here. It's going to be a 4 to 1 multiplexer. And then down here, we're going to have another similar uh, case. And again, we'll have S1 and S0. This is going to get us our lower block now. This is going to be I4 through I7 as the inputs. I4, I5, I6, and I7. And then we'll take those two outputs and we'll put that into a 2 to 1. So this is a four to one. This is a four to one. And this is a two to one. And the selection signal there will just be the S2. That'll be our Y. Let's see why that works. So if S2 is equal to zero, the two to one multiplexer 
takes this first signal and directs it out to Y. And what is that first signal? Well, that's the output of this red block. So it's going to either be I0, 1, 2, or 3, depending on the values of S1 and S0. Now, if S2 is equal to 1, then the 2 to 1 multiplexer takes the, the second input and directs that to Y. That second input is going to be the output of this blue block here. It's going to be one of I4 through I7 as selected by S1 and S0. Okay, so we can just paste together 4 to 1 and 2 to 1 multiplexers to form this 8 to 1. Okay, so that would be an implementation. We don't have to go and build everything from scratch. And of course, then what if we wanted to do a 16 to 1? Well, then we could probably take two 8 to 1 multiplexers and paste them together with a 2 to 1 multiplexer and do a similar kind of trick. Now we'd need four inputs, S3, S2, S1, and S0, and so on. We saw the same kind of idea when we were talking about encoders and decoders. We could do this, the same thing, where once we've got a, a small system, uh, to make a bigger system, often instead of just going from first principles from scratch, we can just paste those smaller systems together to build a bigger system. Okay, so that allows us to very rapidly build an arbitrarily large multiplexer, and we can do the same thing, of course, with a demultiplexer. And in the early days of digital electronics, when integrating, making integrated circuits was a bit of a challenge, it, it, basically you're limited to kind of medium scale integrated circuits, which ha would have a fairly limited number of transistors. Uh, this is how things were actually done on circuit boards, on motherboards, etc., of, of like mainframe computers. You'd have maybe uh, something like this that maybe could be implemented in a 14-pin integrated circuit, and then you would paste many of those together, literally on a circuit board with different connections and stuff to make larger multiplexers. And these days, of course, you can just, this can all be done in integrated an integrated circuit you can just take the little modules for different multiplexers and chain them together like this and make a bigger one and then it all comes out in on the same chip an interesting application of multiplexers is that you can implement a truth table with them So we can implement a truth table using a MUX. So let's see how we might do this. Uh, suppose we have a three input logic variables and let's call them S2, S1, and S0. They could be A, B, and C or whatever, but by doing this, we obviously are drawing an analogy with the selection signals on a multiplexer. And then over here, we've got Y. So we just put in all our possible values, 0, 0, 0. We know that uh, either we're going to have four zeros in the S2, then four ones, and then 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and then 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 will be all our possible values. Now, suppose our truth table is 0, 0, one zero 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 one one okay whatever it is and we have a multiplexer and let's uh, say here's i0 i1 i2 i3 i4 i5 i6 and i7 are the different inputs here And we've got a single output Y. And then here are our selection inputs, S2, S1, and S0. Okay, so if we put in a particular set of values of S2, S1, and S0, that'll correspond to some row in this truth table. And then we just need to make, well, 
what is that going to do? Let's say, for example, we're here in this, this row. Zero, we have S2, S1, and S0. It's 0, 1, 1. Well, that's going to connect 0, 1, 1. That's the 0, 1, 2, 3rd row here. That's connect, co going to connect I3 to Y. So if we want the output to be 0, we just need to make sure that I3 is equal to 0. How can we do that? Well, we can just connect it to ground. Ground is logic 0. So we want the first two connected, not the third, and then the next three, one, two, three, and not the last two. And the ones that are not connected to ground, corresponding to rows that we want the output to be one in, that would be these three rows here, we want to connect those to the logic one voltage, the high voltage, the VCC. All right, so this would, uh, oops, let me, let me redo that. It was getting a little messy there. This multiplexer, just by connecting the different inputs to either the high voltage or the low voltage, then becomes just an implementation of the truth table. And just by changing these connections, we can get a different truth table. That's kind of a convenient application of a multiplexer. Now let's consider demultiplexers. So demux, right? Remember that's kind of the mirror image of a multiplexer. So maybe we've got four outputs, W, X, Y, and Z, and a single input, A, and because we have four outputs, we need two selection signals, because two to the two is equal to four. There's a D mux. Well, let's write a truth table in terms of the selection signals. We've got S1, S0, and we've got four outputs. Okay. So we're going to have W, X, Y, and Z. So here are our inputs 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. All the possibilities. If, and let's assume then that for the first row here, uh, we want W to get the value of A, and then X, Y, and Z are all zero. For the next row, we want X to get the uh, value of A. All the other rows are zero. Third row, we want Y, and the fourth row, we want A. Go to Z. Okay, so this would be our truth table. So noticing that W is non-zero only for the first row here, well, then it would make sense to take the min term expression. So we'd, we'd write then W would be the min term for this row, which would be, these are both zero, so it would be not S1 would be one, and not S0 would also be one. So this would be one and A. And that would be for this row, for, for those values of S1 and S0, zero, zero, this first factor here would be 1, and then so this would, be, would just be 1 and A would be equal to A. W would be equal to A. But for any other row, that factor, not S1 and not S0, one of the factors at least would be 0, and so this whole thing would just be 0. So that would just give us all our other zeros for the output. So that would be for W. X, of course, would be then the next, the uh, min term for the next row would be, see, it's 0 and 1, so that would be not S1 and S0 and A. And Y would be for the next row, 1, 0. So that would be S1 and not S0 and A. And finally, Z for the last row. They're both 1. So that would be S1 and S0 and A. So those would be the logic functions for the four outputs. And if we sketched out what this would look like, let's see, we always need to have A as one of our inputs. So here will be A. We need to have a S, S1, certainly, but we also need not S1, we need S0, and not 
as zero. So we can get that by just having a, an inverter here. Likewise for the S zero, have an inverter. And then just run these guys down vertically. This is very convenient. Way to sketch this out. And for W, well, we're gonna have a three input AND gate. So let's see, the first input's gonna be not S1. Over here to not S1. Next input is gonna be not S0. And the third one's gonna be A. So there would be your three input AND gate for W. And let's just do X and then you'll see the pattern here. For X, we're gonna have a three input uh, AND gate. And the inputs are going to be not S1. So we come over here to, to not S1. S0, zero, zero is here, and A. And that would be X, and likewise for the, the Y and the Z. Now, if you go back and look at our lecture on decoders, you'll see that this is simply a what we call a two to four decoder. Where A is what we call the enable input. So we see that there's a, a very intimate relationship between decoders and demultiplexers. And that suggests another way to implement a demultiplexer. We can use a decoder to implement all of the uh, min terms. Let's call this y0 is not s1 and not s0. And so we call this, that guy there, y0, and this, say, y1, and this, y2, and this, y3. Those would all be the outputs of a decoder, not s1 and s0, y2, is S1 and not S0, and Y3 is S1 and S0. And all we have to do then is to AND those with A. Okay. Which is the input. So what this would look like then, this implementation, would be, would have a two to four decoder here. This would be Y0, Y1, Y2, and Y3. And here would be inputs S1 and S0. And then we just take, for example, uh, here, um, we would AND get uh, W. We would AND this with uh, with A, and then to get X, and the next guy with A, and to get Y, with and following one with A, and finally 
You can see we just, uh, so let's see. One. Oh, I see, I put an extra line there. That's why. Confused me. Okay, and then we had, and the final one with A. Okay, got a little sloppy on the drawing there, but that's the idea. So we could just uh, use a decoder to implement all of the min terms and then just and those with the input A, and that would be another way to implement the demultiplexer. Or if we had an actual uh, 2 to 40 multiplexer with an enable signal, well, then A could just be the enable signal. Now let's talk about numbers. So towards this end, let's write down a truth table. Here we have our row. And let's do that in terms of input logic variables A2, A1, and A0. Now, instead of calling these A, B, and C, when we give them all the same name and then distinguish them through a subscript, we're kind of implying that there's some relation between them. Right, they might be three different numbers that come out of the same black box called box A or something like that. Um, so let's go ahead and just look at what a truth table with these three different values would be. So row zero would be when they're all, all zero. And then row one, we'd have zero, zero, one, and zero, one, zero, and zero, one, one, and then one, zero, zero, one, zero, one. 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. And those would give you row 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Now we've used this, this kind of approach to write down all possible combinations of these three logic variables. And we could have used any approach. They, it doesn't really matter in principle um, what order they come in as long as we write all possible eight combinations of zeros and ones for these three logic variables. But the way we've written them uh, has a very interesting relation to the row number. Let's look at this. Let's take this, for this row here, A0, and let's add that to 2 times A1, and then let's add that to 4 times A2. And let's see what we get. So these are all zeros, so that would be zero. Here you just got uh, A0 is one. Now you got A1 is, is one, and that's times two, and the others are, are zero, so that would be two. Now you've got that, that two plus A0 is one, so that'd be two plus one would be three. And if you continue on down, you're just gonna step through all the decimal digits from zero to seven. Like the last one is gonna be one times four, plus 2 times 1 plus 1. So 4 plus 2 is 6 plus 1 is 7, and so on. So we see that the, the row number is just equal to this combination of these, these uh, logic variables, a2, a1, and a0. And so we can think of these, that combination of those three binary digits, as the binary representation of the row number. So we could say, for example, 7 in base 10 in decimal notation, so we'll put a subscript 10 to indicate that that's in base 10, is equal to 111 in this binary or base 2 system. Now in 5, is equal to 101 in base 2, right? And what does that mean? That means 4 plus 0 plus 1. 4 plus 1 is 5. Now, our day-to-day -day decimal system, of course, has 10 digits, 0 to 9. We have 10 fingers, so that's kind of convenient. Um, and so you can see uh, we're going to tend to get longer strings of digits in the binary system than we would in the decimal system because we only have two digits in the binary system, zero and one. So we might get, you know, 
say, uh, you know, a, a, a decimal number that might, might be one zero one one zero one 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 zero zero one base two, and what would that be equal to? Uh, we'd have to go through and do a whole bunch of arithmetic to figure that out. So it's not very convenient for us to use for day-to-day -day calculations, but boy, is it convenient for a, des uh, a digital system like a microcontroller or a CPU. And the reason is because when we start to do arithmetic, what did you have to do in elementary school when you started to learn how to add, subtract, and multiply, and divide? You had to learn addition tables and multiplication tables. And, you know, if you have 10 digits, uh, you got 10 times 10, and, you know, 100 different entries in that multiplication table, and you had to memorize all that. For the binary case, what do, do our addition and multiplication tables look like? Well, we only have two digits, 0 and 1. 0 and 1. So 0 plus 0 is 0. 0, zero plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 0 is 1. And 1 plus 1 is 2 in base 10. But what's, what's 2? 2 in base 10 equals 1 zero in base two because it's this is zero times one plus one times two to the one power so two plus zero equals so that would be one zero in base two and how about multiplication and that's even nicer zero times anything is zero and one times anything is the thing so there's your multiplication table. Wow, that's pretty nice. Yes, and so, although, again, we're, we're gonna tend to have numbers that have many more digits in base two than they would in base 10, our multiplication and addition tables, and from which those you can figure out to, to do subtraction and division, um, are so simple that it means that we can implement multiplication and addition with very simple logic. And we just need a whole bunch of those very simple logic gates to end up doing multiplication in and addition in the binary number system. So this is why this is so powerful, the binary number system. It's because it's the natural language of a digital system. And because the kinds of calculations that we need to do, everything, you know, pretty much is built up out of basic arithmetic, whether you want to do like sines and cosines and so on. It's built up of a number of multiplications, divisions, and additions and subtractions. If those operations are very simple in our binary system, uh, well, then we can just do, we have to do more of the operations, but they're so simple and the digital systems are so fast that it's a tremendous advantage. Now, one thing is that numbers like this, binary numbers, are not very useful for people to look at. There's just too many digits. It's too hard to follow. And therefore, uh, when you're working with digital systems, with binary systems, it's useful to use a system that has more digits but still is related to the base 2. Now, now base 10, right, 10 is 2 times 5, and... Right, five is a prime number. So uh, we would rather have something that's based on some powers of two. So a very common system to use is the hexadecimal system. Right, which is the base 16. And 16 is two to the fourth because it's four times four. 2 to the 2 squared, 2 to the 4th. Okay, so in the hex system, we'll write now the hexadecimal number, corresponding decimal number, and the binary bin number. So we'll have the digits. So half of these, will, of the first eight, will be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And that would be in hex. It's going to be the same in decimal. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. In binary, well, let's see, uh, 2 to the 4th. That's going to mean we're going to have four binary digits. So this will be 
zero 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 one zero zero one zero 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 one one zero one zero 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 one zero one zero one one zero and zero one 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 and then continuing on <clears throat> so from seven we go to eight nine and then ten we want to have only one digit so we start to use letters a is 10 b is 11 c is 12 d is 13 e is 14 and f is 15. so this is 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 and the binary numbers would be the same ones we had on the left but with the first column the two to the third column uh, replaced with a one. So one zero zero zero, one zero zero one, one zero one zero, one zero one one, one one zero zero, one one zero one, one 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 zero, and one 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 one. Okay, so the hexadecimal system is very useful when we want to represent binary numbers uh, with fewer digits. You know, in our expression. Okay, so if we combine, for example, let's say, you know, in computer systems, we usually use bytes, and one byte equals eight bits, eight di binary digits. So say we had the number one one uh, zero one zero one zero one. Now, if we were to put that into to decimal, we'd have to go through and take each one of these multiply them by the appropriate power of two and then add those all up. But in the hexadecimal system, we can just break these up into two four bit numbers and then just write down their hexadecimal equivalent 1101. Where is that? 1101. That's D or 13. That's D. And 0101. 0101. That's 5. So this is just D5. So what is D5? in base 16 or hexadecimal well let's see d so this would be the ones digits uh, ones place rather sorry the ones digit and then this would be the 16s place so the 16s digit d is 13 in decimal notation so this would be 13 times 16 plus 5 times 1 and that is 200 and 13 and base 10. And so it's much easier to manipulate hexadecimal numbers than binary numbers. And yet there's a simple relationship between hexadecimal digits and binary digits. Each hexadecimal digit counts for four, directly for four binary digits. Whereas if you're in the, the base 10 decimal number system, then it's not so simple because you gotta actually do the, all the arithmetic. Okay, so um, you know, eight bits usually is a byte. We usually call four bits equals a nibble, just some part of a byte. Uh, so each nibble is then a, a single hexadecimal digit. If you use things like a C or the C programming language or Python. Hex numbers are often represented by starting with 0x. So this would be 0x d5. That'd be the way you represent d5 in base 16. Now, what about negative numbers? Obviously, we end up with getting negative numbers whenever we do subtraction of appropriate operands and things. So negative numbers are very important for us. Uh, if we have n binary digits, we can represent any integer from 0 to 2 to the n 
minus 1. All right, so if big N is equal to 3, that would be 0 to 2 to the third is 8 minus 1 is 7, all right? So it's 0 through 7. Uh, if it was N was equal to 4, that'd be 0 to uh, 2 to the fourth is 16 minus 1 is 15. Okay, so that's that's just what we've been doing. Doing here is 0, 0 to 15. All right, so how are we going to represent a negative number? Most straightforward way is kind of like the way we do it in decimal notation. We're going to use a sign digit, or in this case, because we're doing binary, a sign bit. So suppose we have a two bit number, A1 and A0, right? So each of, each of these binary digits is called a bit. And uh, we want to be able to represent either plus or minus that value. So we put a sign bit, S, in front. And we would say that S equals 0 means greater than 0, and S equals 1 implies a negative number. Okay, so how many, uh, what kinds of numbers could we represent in that fashion? So let's see, we would just go through all the possibilities of, this is going to be three binary digits, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1. So what is, this is the binary representation. What is the corresponding decimal? So if the first bit, which is the sign bit, is equal to 0, then just ignore it and just look at the value of the remaining two bits. So these are just would be 0, 1, 2, and 3. All right, this is 2 plus 1 is 3. Now when we have the, the 1 here, then we just get a minus. And this would just go through the same, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So it would just be minus 0, minus 1, minus 2, and minus 3. Now one kind of quirky thing about this is that notice that you get two, two zeros. You get plus and minus 0, which is kind of redundant. Now, this, this approach is very simple, and it's very sim similar to what we do in, in decimal. Uh, in that case, we just add a plus or minus sign, a, a new digit, basically. But we're going to be constrained to just use zeros and ones, so we're going to make this distinction for the sign bit, that zero is positive and one is, is negative. So imagine that that's kind of like, you know, we can use plus and minus, and we usually just don't put the plus, right? If, we don't say plus 7, we just say 7. So this is kind of the same idea. We use 0. 0, that just means positive. And if we put actual 1 bit there, then that would be negative. OK, so we get two, uh, two zeros. Now, there's another problem. Let's, let's consider using the sign bit idea. Let's say we have the numbers 0, 1, 0, plus. 0, 0, 1. Okay, these are both of the sign bits are 0, so these are both positive. So this is just 2 plus 0, so this is just 2 plus 1, should be 3. So see, 0 plus 1 is 1, and 1 plus 0 is 1. And let's add the 0 plus 0 to get 0. Okay, and what would this be equal to? This is 2, it's in the 2's place, plus 1 is equal to 3 base 10. All right, that makes sense. But when we add a negative number to a positive number, that's equivalent to doing subtraction. Let's, let's see what happens here. Let's say we have 0, 1, 0, um, plus, and now let's put a negative number. Let's do 1, 0, 1. All right, what is this representing? 0, 1, 0, that's 2. All right, so this is 2, and this is a negative number, so it's plus a negative number, so minus 1, 0, 1 is minus 1. This should be 2 minus 1 is equal to 1 is what we should get. What do we get? Let's just add 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 0 is 1. 0 plus 1 is 1. So we get all 1s. And what would that actually be? 1, 1, 1 would be minus 3, which, of course, is not right. So we can't just simply 
add all the bits together by the normal rules of binary arithmetic and including the sign bit as just another digit. Okay, so that's the downside of just using a sign bit. So people have come up with different ways to represent negative numbers that lead to more convenient arithmetic operations. One approach uh, to representing negative numbers is called one's complement. So uh, going back to the sign bit idea, so say we have a number that's greater than or equal to zero, it's non-negative, and we write it with a zero sign bit, and then let's just limit ourselves now to two digits, two binary digits, A1 and A0. So if we're going then to complement this, that means to just do the not operation on each one of the bits. So zero becomes one, a1 becomes not A1, and A0 becomes not A0. And that represents negative A1, A0. Okay, so let's see how this works by just writing out the decimal representations of all possible 3-bit combinations here. So 0, 0, 0. So if the first digit is a zero, then it's a positive number, right? So this is just be zero, zero, it would be decimal zero. Zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, 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 one, one. So that's zero, one, two, and three. Now what about one, zero, zero? So to figure out what that is, we uncomplement it. So one, zero, zero, uncomplement it, just flip each one of the bits, toggle each one of the bits, that's zero, one, one. 0, 1, 1 is 3, so this 1, 0, 0 is the complement of 0, 1, 1. That must be minus 3. And likewise, you can just go through here. 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. That's minus 3, minus 2, minus 1, and minus 0. Again, we've got two zeros, a little bit redundant. 0 and minus 0. That's called the 1's complement. Um, so... Again, it's a little bit like it looks a little bit like the sign bit idea. All positive or non-negative numbers start with a zero, and all negative numbers start with a one. But it is right. So there's a, but the in the other two digits is a little bit different, right? Because of this negation, uh, doing the not operation on them. Let's just see if it fixes the problem of adding a positive and a negative number. In other words, doing subtraction. So let's look at 0, 1, 0 plus 1, 1, 0. So what does this represent? 0, 1, 0 is 2. And then this is plus 1, 1, 0 is minus 1. So 2 plus minus 1 or 2 minus 1. This should be equal to 1. Let's do the addition. 0 plus 0 is 0. 1 plus 1 is what? 2. And right, 1 plus 1 is equal to 2 in base 10 which is 1, 0 in base 2. So as we do in our decimal arithmetic, we can't represent that with one digit, so we put the lowest value digit there, the 1's digit, 0, and carry the 1. Now 1 plus 0 plus 1 is 2, so put the zero, a 0 and carry a 1. And now we got this uh, extra digit. We usually had three digits here, now we got a fourth digit. And so our rule with 1's complement is that we wrap around and add that fourth digit there back into the one's place. And so that would then give us the final result where we would take these three digits, 0, 0, 0, and add in the wrapped around 1, and what we, would we get? 0, 0, 1, of course, and that's equal to 1. That's equal to 1 in base 10 which is exactly what we expected to get. And if you go through and do that for other kinds of combinations, you find that this works out as long as you do this wraparound idea. So if you get a 1 here in this fourth place, you got to wrap it around and, and add it in. Um, and so in the past, this was a very common and very popular way to represent 
negative numbers on digital systems, but it's largely been superseded by so-called two's complement, which we turn to now. Okay, so now two's complement. So two's complement is a little bit weird to get used to at first, um, but we'll see why it, it works out quite well. So suppose we have a number representing two's complement that has three digits, A2, A1, and A0. Well, the corresponding uh, decimal representation is going to look like this, minus A2 times 2 to the 2, right? So this is the, this is the 2 to the 0 place, this is 2 to the 1 place, and this is 2 to the 2. But we assume that that most significant digit there has a minus sign associated with it. So it's minus A2 times 2 to the 2 plus A1 times 2 to the 1 plus A0 times 2 to the 0. So if you work this out now for all possible three-digit numbers, here's what you get. So zero, zero, zero. So if the first, uh, the most significant digit is zero, then then you don't have any negative component, and you just get a non-negative number with these two digits as we've done before. So zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero, zero, one, one. That's going to be zero, one, two, three, just like all of our other number systems. Now we go one, zero, zero. Well, that's one in the fours place, but we assume that's got a negative, so that's going to be minus four. And then one, zero, one, well that's minus four plus one, which is minus three. And then one, one, zero, that's minus four plus two, which is minus two. And one, 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 that's minus four plus two plus one, or minus four plus three, which is minus one. So the first thing you notice is that there is only a single zero. There's no minus zero. And so we can actually represent numbers from 0 to 3, and then negative numbers, minus 1 down to minus 4. Now let's look at uh, taking 0, 1, 0, plus 1, 1, 1. Now what should this represent? 0, 1, 0 is 2, so this should represent 2, plus 1, 1, 1 is minus 1. So this should be 2 minus 1 is equal to 1, is what we should get. So 0 plus 1 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, which is 0 carry the 1, and 1 plus 0 plus 1 is 2, which is 0 carry the 1. And here's the nice thing now. If we get any additional carry bit here, we just simply throw that out. And what is that equal to? 0, 0, 1, which is equal to 1. So, and if you do that for any other combinations, you'll notice that that it works as long as you don't get uh, you don't get overflow, right? Because if we're limiting ourselves to these three digits, for example, let's say I was to take three plus three, zero zero one. Uh, I'm sorry, zero one one, zero one one, plus zero one one, and we say one plus one is two, so that's zero carry the one. 1 plus 1 plus 1, that's 3. That's 1, 1 in binary, 2 plus 1. So 1 carry the 1, and then 1 plus 0 plus 0 is 1. And 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, that would be minus 2, which it shouldn't be. This should be 3 plus 3 is equal to 6. The problem is 6 does not fall into this range of numbers. In other words, I would need additional binary digits to represent a number that, that big. So this, this is a problem of overflow. So you always got to watch out for that. Um, so as long as your numbers you're adding together don't produce overflow, this two's complement works beautifully. Uh, you just throw away any extra digit you get here, which is turns out when you implement this with, with logic gates is extremely convenient. You just leave something off you just don't even deal with whatever the overflow would be. Uh, and then it, it produces the appropriate sums, including sums of positive and negative numbers. So 
Let's look at one other thing. And that is, how do we actually calculate with like a circuit and the two's complement? Well, let's take a look here. At decimal numbers, the one's complement and the two's complement. And let's look at negative numbers, minus three, minus two, and minus one. So the one's complement would be one, zero, zero, right? Three would be uh, zero for a sign bit, of, of meaning that it's not negative, and then three would be one, one. And so we complement that, zero, one, one becomes one, zero, zero. And minus two is one, zero, one, and minus one is one, one, zero. And what are the, what's the two's complement? We can just read it from up here. Uh, here's minus three, minus two, and minus one. So that's one, zero, one, 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 zero, and one, one, one. <clears throat> now notice something. The two's complement is simply the one's complement plus one. Right? One, zero, zero, plus one is one, zero, one. Just doing this in normal arithmetic, forgetting about sign bits or any of that stuff. One, zero, one, plus one is one, one, zero. One, one, zero, plus one is one, one, one. So you can take the one's complement, which is very simple because you just negate each one of the bits. You just flip each one of the bits or toggle each one of the bits, and then just add one. So we'll see that's a very convenient way to calculate the two's complement, and we're going to use that later when we look at how to build addition and subtraction circuits.